Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Cheetash. My name is Chris, and today we're going to be talking about 1984, Chapter 2, Part 9. We're going to be talking about Winston reading Goldstein's book, actually starting to read it, and he's going to be going through this section titled War is Peace. And if you guys remember, where does this come from? Well, it's one of the three party slogans War is Peace, Ignorance is Strength, Freedom is Slavery. And Big Brother is always watching. Winston got Goldstein's book from his meeting with O'Brien. He comes back to Sherrington's shop. He's up in his room and he opens it up and he's finally going to start to read it. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. And let me click over here. We'll start. There we go. Finally, we got it. <laughs> so... He skips ahead, actually. He starts at chapter one, Ignorance is Strength. And then he kind of takes a little bit of a break. He takes a little bit of a breather, takes it all in. And then he skips ahead to chapter three, which is War is Peace. So remember, when you're reading this, and this is on page 189 for me, he's reading from Goldstein's book here. So it's kind of interesting. It's a book within the book, 1984. And the chapter starts off with stating that there are these three super states, right? There's Eurasia, there's East Asia, there's Oceania. And we've heard these names throughout the entire book so far. Obviously, Winston is in London, which is in Oceania, this super state of Oceania. So a part of the British Isles, but the British Isles are a part of Oceania, which is also the Americas, the Atlantic Islands. You guys can see the slide there. And then there's also uh, Eurasia, and there's also East Asia. And remember, these are the other countries that Oceania, Oceania goes to war with. So let's continue on. Goldstein in his book talks about this sort of permanent war that is happening between the three super states. And it's permanent because none of the three super states are going to be able to destroy each other. They essentially have been at a constant stalemate. And then this is kind of due to the proliferation of nuclear weapons. And every one of them is so strong and can destroy each other that there's no use to actually like directly attack anybody. Any attacks are surprise attacks, and they're only in certain areas. We're going to talk about that in a second. So they're unable to destroy each other. There's no material cause for fighting because from, I believe, what Goldstein is saying here is all these super states have the ability to get the materials that they need to make their economies, their, their societies prosper. There, there's no real reason to go to war anymore. And there's no real ideological difference between these three super states. Ingsoc is at the principal, like, founding level, the base level of, I don't want to say control, but it's like the base principle in Oceania. But Ingsoc is the same principles that are a part of Ingsoc, like Doublethink, for example. They also persist in Eurasia and East Asia. They're just called different things. We're uh, we're going to mention that in a few slides coming up. And the attitudes towards wars have not changed. None of the super states, again, they can't be conquered. So the wars that are fighting and going on, they're not decisive. There's nothing to fight about. And like I said, all the states have everything they're, they need as far as natural resources, but the fighting is for labor power, and the fighting only takes place in this rough quadrilateral. These four sections here of Tangier, Brazzaville, Darwin, and Hong Kong. And these are between the frontiers of the super states, not permanently in possession of any of them. So they're constantly struggling for these areas. The, the disputed territories, and they're fighting over them because they contain cheap labor. And the ownership of these disputed territories passes from conqueror to conqueror. The wars never move beyond those territories, 
but they don't really need them. They don't really need them. That, that cheap labor and stuff in those disputed territories, they don't add anything to the economy of the super states, but they only are used as a purpose towards more war. Another war. So that cheap labor is just used to fund more wars. And this is the aim of the modern warfare that is going on in the present time of 1984. The aim of modern warfare is to use up the products of the machine without raising the standard of living. Very interesting. Nobody's progressing in Oceania because all the results, all the the fruits of the labor of war are just used to just... And Goldstein mentions how the world of today is primitive compared to what it used to be. So the machine, the, the, the war machine, the military industrial complex, maybe you could call it, could be used for forces of good. You totally could, instead of putting all these resources, let me see if I get my page right. All these resources could totally be used to end hunger, illiteracy, overwork, but then this would end the hierarchical society. This would put everybody on an even playing field because all of these tangibles here, hunger, illiteracy, work, they're concentrated into this hierarchy. So some people are less hungry than others. Some people are more literate than others. Think about like the inner party and like comparing it to the proles. So if the machine is used to solve these issues, then there's not going to be this power structure. And Goldstein notes that wealth is evenly distributed, but the power is still in the few. I think we're, we'll are we talk about this next time in the ignorance of strength chapter. But like the, the inner party makes up like, I think it was like 2%, something like that's 2% of the entire population, yet they have like all the control and the proles are like 80% of it. And this continuous warfare allows for goods to be produced, but not distributed. Again, they're produced to just fund more wars. They're never distributed to the masses. So think about like the chocolate ration. Where's that chocolate ration probably going? Well, to the people fighting the war. That's why there's not enough for the people. I mean, there definitely is, but most of that maybe is going to the people fighting the wars, just as like an example. So the essential act of war, what is the essential act of war? The, uh, the purpose of war, I guess, is what Goldstein is going for here. This of war is the destruction of human labor. And don't make the masses too comfortable. Destruction of human labor and don't make the masses too comfortable. So the destruction of human labor in that the human labor is never used. The human labor that is used to produce the goods in Oceania is never used to distribute those goods to the people themselves. I, it's, I believe it's used just to fund more wars, essentially, keep the machine going. And also, wars make people uncomfortable. And it's essentially used to drive fear in the people to then motivate them to back these wars even more. So it's like a unanimous thing. Why would we stop the wars? The people love the wars. Why do they love the wars? They don't love the wars, but they're fearful of the invasion of these other countries. But again, none of these super states ever invade each other. And all the fighting takes place in these little territories. But the masses don't know that, right? The masses don't know that. And again, the war effort eats up any surplus that is produced from the labor that is going on in Oceania. War is meant to bring the population towards hardship. Again, scarcity and small privileges. Again, with the chocolate ration, 
not a lot of chocolate to go around, so there's scarcity. So, hey, we're going to just give you this little bit of chocolate, and you should be lucky that you're getting this little bit of chocolate. Right, that's what the party gets. That's what maybe even the proles get. But remember, the inner party has the access to like the good chocolate. Remember when Julia brings Winston like the inner party chocolate, and he says it tastes. It, I mean, it tasted so much better than the regular chocolate. And again, this just magnifies the distinctions between the groups and keeps everybody in this hierarchical society and easier to control. Party members. Party members, Goldstein states, there's a purpose to them in that you can't just be a part of the party. And I think this is mentioned in Ignorance of Strength. You, you, you're not born into the party. You basically have to be interviewed and like chosen to be in it. And not everybody can be a party member. Now, party members still have to be competent and intelligent but like Syme, maybe, who was a little too smart for his own good, you can't ask too many questions. And Winston thinks that that's kind of why Syme was vaporized or disappeared. Because he knows so much about Newspeak, about the party, etc., that, hey, if that information got into the wrong hands, it could be used as a negative. So party members, they got to be smart, they got to be competent, but they also need to be fearful, full of hate and adulation. They got to be super anxious and able to be persuaded because the party members are being used to the state of war, to further the war between the super states. And Goldstein mentions it's like a man in interstellar space. There's no way to know which way is up or down. And this is the same thing with that we kind of see, like in Oceania. There's announcements on the telescreens, but other than that, how do you really know that that's true, what they're telling you? Because they've switched who the enemy is. They switched like, oh, yeah, we're fighting East Asia. No, now we're fighting Eurasia. Remember that we just talked about this. They switched it on the dime during hate week. Like, all of a sudden, we're fighting East Asia now when East Asia used to be the enemy. So it's like the the common folk of Oceania, they don't know, they can't tell what's going on outside. They require the telescreen to tell them, to the party or big brother to tell them this. So the party's got a couple goals of Oceania. They want to conquer the whole surface of the earth and they want to extinguish independent thought. How are they doing this? They're using science to do this. Am I on this page? Am I on this page? I think I'm on this page. Here we go. Science is being used to further this agenda, but in other areas, it is non-existent. So they like science as far as it furthers these two goals. But other than that, they don't really want you to use science. Because the party's going to tell you what's right and what's wrong. There's no need to do experiments. We'll tell you what you should be doing, what's in your best interest. They, honestly, the there's two great problems. One is how to discover against his will what another human being is thinking. And two, how to kill millions of people at once. That's what science is trying to discover Insofar as scientific research still continues, this is its subject matter, these two things. So the wartime strategy. We mentioned this a little bit earlier. The super states do not risk defeat. They try to surround the enemy and sign a friendship pact. They then stock up bombs to obliterate them and make friendship with the next state. Right, so... They kind of lure them in with this friendship pack, pact. And then they try to make friends with the other state. But this is like damn near impossible, says Goldstein. This is damn near impossible. I'm trying to... F- the plan is... Here we go. 
The plan is, by a combination of fighting, bargaining, and well-timed strokes of treachery, to acquire a ring of bases completely encircling one of the rival states. They then try to sign a pact of friendship with the rival, remain on peaceful terms for so many years as to lull suspicion to sleep. During this time, they're stocking up. Finally, they will all be fired simultaneously with effects so devastating as to make retaliation impossible. And then they sign a friendship pact with the other remaining world power in preparation for another attack. Everybody's trying to do this, by the way, but this scheme is hardly necessary to say it's a mere daydream of impossible realization, says Goldstein. No fighting ever occurs except in those disputed areas, that quadri quadrilateral, quadrangle, whatever you want to call it. Um, and no invasions of enemy territory are ever undertaken. Again, it's only in those disputed areas. So nobody in Oceania, besides like the prisoners, like those war prisoners, that remember there's like public hangings of East Asian spies and stuff that we've talked about. Um, Winston and Julia actually meet in the town square, Victory, was it Victory Square? Um, during like a public like humiliation of war prisoners. But other than that, they don't see the foreigners. They never see another citizen from another super state. And there's a reason for this. Because if, this is Goldstein, if he were allowed contact with foreigners, he would discover that they are creatures similar to himself and that most of what he has been told about them is lies. And then this would hurt the entire agenda of keeping this machine propagating and wars propagating because they'll see that, hey, these guys are just like me. They're, they're not the enemy. Think about that propaganda of that, of that soldier on that poster, how menacing it was looking. The gun is pointed right at you when you're looking at the poster. But now you see the citizens of these other super states for what they actually are might make you not want to go to war with them, right? So again, these are the three philosophies that exist in those super states, Ingsoc and Oceania. Uh, then what is it? Uh, Eurasia, Neo-Bolshevism, East Asia. It's a Chinese name translated to death worship, but perhaps better rendered as obliteration of the self. The citizen of Oceania is not allowed to know anything of the tenets, of the other two philosophies, but he is taught to execrate them as barbarous outrages upon morality and common sense. But everywhere there is the same parameter structure, same worship of a semi-divine leader, the same economy existing by and for continuous warfare. So there's nothing different. These are all essentially the same. Principally, all these philosophies are the same. I'm just checking here. Was this my last slide? Yeah, okay, this is the last slide. Permanent peace would be the same as permanent war. Principally, all of these are the same. All of these are the same. And this is from the, towards the ending here, this, yeah, this is my last slide. A peace that was truly permanent would be the same as a permanent war. This, although the vast majority of party members understand it only in a shallower sense, is the inner meaning of the party slogan, War is peace. Because the very word of war is, is misleading. It would be probably accurate to say that by becoming continuous, war has ceased to exist. And essentially, by ceasing to exist, it seems like peace. And this is what is meant by war is peace, that the war machine has propagated so much that it has entrenched itself in everybody's everyday lives that they've learned to live with it, and they're at peace with it. The effect would be the same if the three super states, instead of fighting one another, should agree to live in perpetual peace. For in that case, each would still be self a self-contained universe. And that's the thing. Continuous war, they're still in a they're in a self-contained universe. They're not going out. They're they're protecting their own, seemingly protecting their own, and they're so afraid of the other super states. But if they were peaceful, they'd still be self-contained. We don't have to worry about anything. Everything's here. So this is what is meant by that war is peace. And this is my last slide, guys. Wow, thank you very much for listening this far. Power of 
powerful stuff in this Goldstein's book. Uh, we're going to continue next time when Winston opens up to chapter back to chapter one of Goldstein's book, where Goldstein is going to discuss ignorance is strength. This is going to be talking about the party politics specifically. So war is peace. This talked about why why Oceania is constantly at war. Next time we're going to talk about some of the stuff about the party and the makeup of the party and the people of Oceania. And notice that this is the second part. And next time we're going to have part three. That's the last part. But he's not going to get to all three slogans of Goldstein's book. War is peace, ignorance is strength, freedom is slavery. We're not going to get to the freedom of slavery part, so think about that. If you guys have read ahead and already know what happens, think about that. And again, guys, thank you very much. Check out the blog. I think we'll do discussion questions next time. And that's going to do it for today. Thank you guys for listening this far. Let me know if you have any questions. My name is Chris. This has been Cheetash. Take care.